I spoiled you with the Allen time lapse before. This time your stickability will be rewarded at the end. We're talking about wires and some education I've undertaken in hindsight to correct my mistake when wiring up Allen's solar panels. Good timing though for a film with close-ups. My general purpose filming lens doesn't focus particularly close, so I've treated myself to an extension tube. How exciting. Okay, first of all apologies for any noise you might be able to hear. They're running a crane outside to lift a boat up and they're going to be doing it for ages so I'm just going to get on and do this. It's not going to be a very long one this time round, but I want to show you uh, a misunderstanding that I'd had regarding some of my wiring up and the changes that I'm making to try and fix that problem. And that is about the gauge of different sorts of wire. So you, you'll know from previous videos that I like to use these high quality, very flexible, high strand count, uh, silicon sheathed wires. And they're fantastic. But what I've been doing is making slightly incorrect calculations regarding the gauge that I need for different usage. You, you'll, you'll find that whenever you see my wiring, there'll be various sizes of, uh, of wire, of course. For some things, you need to be able to carry a much higher current than in others. But it's the, the factor of distance from one thing to the next, one thing that I'm connecting to another, that's actually caused the problem. And that's because I've been misunderstanding the headroom of current handling. Let's say a current is rated to carry 15 amps or 20 amps or 25 amps. I've always been working on the principle, particularly for short distance wiring work, so you know, less than a foot, really, really short distance, that you simply add some headroom so that you're not getting too close to the rating. Uh, you, you fuse things correctly, of course, uh, and then you're, you're, you're absolutely fine. You're not going to lose any power along the way through, res through resistance. Uh, what I've not understood is how quickly uh, distance comes into things. I'll illustrate what I mean here with the configuration in which I first noticed the problem. There's about six or seven meters of wiring between the solar panels and the solar charge controllers. So let's wire up using the initial thinner gauge of conductor first. It was selected based on having that comfortable headroom of current rating. I'll never need more than 6 amps for my solar setup, and these wires can handle 16 amps before they could overheat and risk becoming a glorified fuse at best, or a fire risk at worst. Here's the open voltage across the two panels in series, on a bright summer's day. Just over 37 volts. This should be over 40 volts, or even up to 45 in strong sunlight. So something is wrong. A serious voltage drop. When connected through the controller to a 12 volt battery, it's a pretty sorry tale. Only a fraction of an amp is flowing, and not even 3% of my system's maximum output. Let's go two sizes up. Sporting the story somewhat, this is the gauge I've subsequently calculated to be what I needed in the first place. But there we go, up at 43 volts, and we have a very healthy flow of energy. It became a little more cloudy outside, so 60 to 70 watts is respectable, and you can see there how you won't ever achieve the full open voltage once the circuit has a load placed on it. A quick tip for those of you doing experiments like this, where you may have live wires with exposed ends lying around. Solar panels exposed to light are always live, as it were, so we want to avoid accidental short circuits by letting the positive and negatives touch. You could physically separate them, or put some tape over the ends, but I like this. If you have any inline lever connectors, they neatly keep the ends together, but safely isolated. Obviously, do not do this with normal lever connectors that actually form a connection between the wires mounted side by side. It would somewhat defeat the object. Let's get back to these wires, thick and thin, and we'll look at the actual numbers in a moment. It's a little inconvenient as the physical bulk will take up more space in my cable tidying conduits and in any glands, but if you choose the right wires in the first place, you won't have this problem when planning. Here are the specifics in my example. The panels each are max rated to 18 volts and 5.5 amps, so in series, twice that voltage but the same current. The wire's silicon jacket contains many, many strands of tinned copper conductor. Make sure you input all the information correctly when using the calculator. This is the correct gauge for me, 14. It can safely carry 30 amps, over 5 times what my solar array needs. But critically, over 7 meters, the voltage drop is 0.6 of a volt, under 2%. Anything under 2% is considered okay. Lower is of course always better, but you can't use tree trunk like 8 gauge wire for everything. Here's what I erroneously used initially, the thinner 18 gauge. Over 7 meters, the voltage drop is 1.6 volts, 
which is 4.5%, and the reason for the terrible performance. I knew from the start that voltage drop was a consideration, but the extent and how quickly it kicks in caught me off guard. This was the wire spec sheet, showing all the details you need, the physical size so you can plan your cable routing, the metal cross-section area, and the reassurance that you have 150 strands. Great news for flexing durability. I'm aware that there's an unsettled debate about the behaviour of many versus few strands, but for my needs, these are great. Pros outweigh the cons. The maximum current for safety is 16 amps, but we now know that not to be the whole story. In fact, let's see how the performance drops off as we lengthen the wire. One meter is okay at max rated current, but even as you select two meters, the voltage drop becomes unacceptable. At seven meters, totally useless. Something else to keep in mind when deciding on your wiring, the physical sizes and the capacity of your conduits and so on. The thickness of the wire, or the cable if you have two or three conductors bundled together, isn't necessarily indicative of the amount of conductor in there. Wire sheaths vary from single skin to multi-jacketed ones, reinforcements and so on. A seriously chunky cable might be as tough as hell, but still not actually have as much conductive metal inside as you expect. So check the specifications or cut the wire and measure it. This has meant, therefore, I needed to deroute, unroute, cease from being rooted, all that 18 gauge wire. I can use it for other shenanigans, I'm certain. The terminals where the wires meet the solar panels, standard waterproof MC4 connectors, must be swapped over too. My time saving technique is to buy ready made adapted cables with a male and a female terminal on each end, already professionally soldered, assembled, and sealed, and then I chop and refit whatever long distance wire I want. You may wonder why an electrics purist will rightly observe that it's not very elegant. Please direct your apoplectic rage into the comment section, especially that Scottish jet ski guy who always complains. He's tons of fun. But aside from the efficiency, there's a practical reason. The weather seal inside the MC4 connector is designed to fit around the stiff hard jacket you get on most normal solar wires. Silicon compresses differently and wears differently and it doesn't adhere. I think I could end up messing up the mechanical seal if using components not destined for one another. There's a lesson in there somewhere. There are also tons of conflicting online assertions about how to splice wire ends together. The ends here are dissimilar, thin, flexible, numerous strands and thicker, fewer, stiffer strands. So here I'm dividing into pairs and twisting both together before soldering. I left my flux at home so struggled with flow but persevered with the right temperature and finally got a nice joint. This one I did a few days back and I've used normal UV resistant 2 to 1 ratio heat shrink. For the next pair though, I've invested in a roll of really nice 4 to 1 transparent flexible heat shrink. It means I can use one diameter for many uses and even double up if I fancy. It's worth remembering that if using high ratio heat shrink around reasonably thin wires within, you'll end up with a thicker, stiffer shrunken jacket. Two different examples here, both double thickness and it just depends on the profile you want. A final reminder, the adhesive that lines many heat shrink tubes won't bond to silicon, so you need to rely on the shrink compression for the weather seal. It took some amount of retrofitting up top, as the connectors, enclosures and glands had been sized to be just large enough for 18 gauge wire. I've had to use two enclosures instead of one for now, but we'll probably order a better size, and I'm improvising wraps to protect the wires as they exit the enclosure. I didn't have rubber grommets small enough, but I will. I've left enough length of wire free so everything can be removed from the box and fiddled with, but this results in something of a mess. Some twist ties restore law and order. Now only the internal work needs completing before I can put this solar saga to bed and get on with the other big summer jobs aboard Allen. My semicircular trunking here won't swallow four 14 gauge wires, so I'll have to wrench it off and replace. Otherwise the rest of the installation is ready and I won't bother you with it again. The solar and wind box has the finishing touches applied now, neat glands to allow the wires in and out. If you're like me and have a few things along the length of the wire like soldered inline fuses and click connectors, make sure you don't have them both sides of the gland, otherwise you'll have to cut or unsolder something later if you need to make adjustments. That's why lever or Wago connectors are super. Takeaway points for you. The cable's amp rating on the spec sheet is a safety limit only. If you exceed it, your problems may be much more serious than just voltage drop. For wire lengths under a meter, you're okay to use it as a sizing guide, but if performance matters for longer lengths, check the voltage drop charts first and plan your scintillatingly exciting wiring purchase correctly. 
Oh, and the time lapse. You've earned it. Nah, not quite yet. I've published another video over on my other channel, arguably, this time about sinister social media overlords that may or may not exist. So go and watch that too. And now, truly, the time lapse, without voiceover distraction. Bye.